2,000 years ago, this was a thriving fishing village. Five of the fishermen that lived here left this village, turned the world upside down and changed the course of human history. One of them was a very angry young man. He and his brother were called the Sons of Thunder. But something happened that turned his life around and changed him forever. He ended up writing five books of the Bible. Four of them are even named after him. That's more than anyone else. And he's referred to more than 30 times in the Bible. His name was John. And this is his story. It follows John from an angry young man wanting to destroy his enemies by fire to becoming one of Jesus' most influential disciples. John underwent a remarkable transformation as a disciple, from the quick-tempered son of thunder to the compassionate apostle of love. How did he do it? What made all the difference? What was the secret of his transformation? Well, stay with us to find out. His story will encourage and inspire you. And maybe what enhanced and changed his life will do the same for you as well. This is a place of miracles. Here in the ancient fishing village of Bethsaida and along the nearby northern shore of the Sea of Galilee, Jesus performed some of his most incredible miracles. Here, Jesus met a blind man. He took him by the hand, healed him and restored his sight. Nearby, Jesus taught a great crowd of people. At the end of the day, when they got hungry and there was no food for them to eat, Jesus took the lunch of a young boy and multiplied his five loaves and two small fish into enough food for over 5,000 people. And it was from here at Bethsaida that Jesus walked on the water across the Sea of Galilee. The disciples left Bethsaida by boat to sail to the other side of the lake. Jesus remained behind alone to pray. At night, a wild storm arose and the disciples were afraid their boat would sink and they all would drown. But then they saw Jesus walking to them on the water. After Jesus entered the boat, the wind stopped and they arrived safely at land. All of these miracles and many more happened right here around Bethsaida. Yes, this sure is a place of miracles. In fact, this is where it all began. Christianity started right here in this area. When Jesus began his work and needed people to help him, he called special people, disciples, to join him and follow him. And five of those first followers or disciples were born and lived here in Bethsaida. Peter, Andrew, Philip, James and John all came from Bethsaida and worked here as fishermen. And so this ancient town, Bethsaida, on the northern shores of the Sea of Galilee, has great biblical importance. It's mentioned 13 times in the Gospels. That's more than any other city, with the exception of Jerusalem and Capernaum. And that shouldn't surprise us, because Jesus did most of his work preaching, teaching and healing in this area. Now, archaeologists are peeling back the layers to unravel the history of ancient Bethsaida, and they're making some amazing discoveries. The city dates back 1,000 years before the time of Christ. The spectacular finds here include the remains of a large royal palace and the largest and best preserved ancient city gate in Israel, showing that it was once a well-fortified city. Due to the careful work of the archaeologists, now we can walk along the same cobblestone streets that Jesus walked when he was here. 
Among the discoveries is the House of the Fisherman. It was built of basalt and was probably two stories high and included a paved open courtyard surrounded by several rooms. They identified it as belonging to a fisherman because in it they discovered an anchor, stone net weights, a fish hook and a needle for repairing the nets. As the site continues to be excavated, there are sure to be more wonderful and exciting surprises as ancient Bethsaida, the city of miracles, comes back to life. But perhaps what's most surprising of all is that although Jesus performed so many miracles here and spent so much time teaching the people of Bethsaida and the surrounding towns, they still rejected him and his teachings. This frustrated and disappointed Jesus, and he issued a stern warning to them for their lack of faith. But in contrast to the majority of Bethsaida's inhabitants who rejected Jesus, five of the city's native sons, Peter, Andrew, Philip, James and John, responded to Christ's call and gave up everything to follow him. They became part of a special group of 12 men that Jesus chose to work with him and be his disciples. And three of them, Peter, James and John, became part of a sort of inner circle who Jesus selected to exclusively witness three major events. The raising of Jairus' daughter from the dead, the transfiguration of Christ on the Mount, and Jesus' agonizing prayer in the Garden of Gethsemane just before his crucifixion. These three, Peter, James and John, were given unique opportunities and got closer to Jesus than anyone else. And interestingly, they are the only disciples that Jesus gave nicknames to. But there was nothing special about these three disciples. They were just ordinary fishermen from Bethsaida. And John, like the others, was far from perfect. He was impatient, intolerant and bad-tempered. He was an angry young man. But something happened that turned him around and changed his life forever. John underwent a remarkable transformation as the disciple, from the quick-tempered son of thunder to the compassionate apostle of love. How did he do it? What made all the difference? What was the secret of his transformation? Well, let's follow his journey and find out. Sometime after leaving his boat and fishing nets at Bethsaida, John, along with Jesus and the other disciples, headed south to Jerusalem through Samaria. John was asked to make arrangements for lodging in the town up ahead, and he seemed glad to be of service. He was the youngest of the 12 men that Jesus had chosen to be his apostles, but already he'd shown leadership qualities. John, accompanied by his brother James, hurried on down a rocky hill toward the village in fading light, determined to make the master proud of him. True, making arrangements might be a bit tricky. After all, this was Samaria, a place most Jews avoided. There'd been bad blood between the Jews and the Samaritans since long before John was born. In fact, most people traveling from the Sea of Galilee down to Jerusalem, as Jesus was, avoided the land of Samaria altogether. They took a detour around through Perea, but Jesus had chosen the direct route south. After entering the village through the town gate, John and James asked around for lodging. A great teacher named Jesus would be spending the night, they said. Middle Eastern custom dictated that hospitality always be shown to strangers. Well, at first, the Samaritans tried to oblige, but then they heard that Jesus was actually on his way to Jerusalem to celebrate a great feast at the temple. Well, the Samaritans folded their arms and pressed their lips together sneeringly. They said that they had no shelter for a party intending to honor their religious rivals in Jerusalem. Well, John tried to reason with them. Did they know who this Jesus was? Hadn't they heard of the great wonders he'd performed? The Samaritans wouldn't budge. So John and James had to leave town 
and head back up the hill to meet Jesus. And as John walked, he grew more and more angry. He kept seeing those stubborn Samaritan faces shaking their heads. John wasn't used to being insulted. He'd grown up in a very comfortable home in Bethsaida. His father operated a prosperous fishing business here on the Galilee with boats and nets and large catches with hired servants. His mother was a woman of some means. The family had connections with the high priest in Jerusalem. Who did these poor Samaritans think they were? And what really galled John was that they'd refused to shelter his master. Just days before this, John had stood on a mountaintop with Jesus and watched in awe. Christ became a dazzling divine figure right before his eyes. And Moses and Elijah appeared from heaven to honour Christ. John had seen his master shining like the sun. And now these lowly Samaritans presumed their wretched village was too good for him. Incredible. By the time John met up with Jesus, his indignation was about to explode. John and his brother quickly explained the situation. And then John's eye caught Mount Carmel in the distance behind them, the place where Elijah had called down fire from God out of heaven, the place where the prophets of Baal had been struck down. Filled with zeal, John burst out with these words recorded in Luke chapter 9 and verse 54. Lord, do you want us to command fire to come down from heaven and consume them just as Elijah did? John wanted to demonstrate his loyalty. He wanted those who dishonoured his Christ to be crushed. But Jesus looked away from him. He gazed down for a moment at the cluster of houses barely visible in the dusk. Then he turned back to John and said, again in Luke chapter 9, verses 55 and 56, You do not know what manner of spirit you are of. For the Son of Man did not come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. And then Jesus suggested that they try the next village. John's master understood him much better than he understood himself. When he called John and James to be among the 12, he gave them a nickname. He called them the Sons of Thunder. These young men had plenty of fire in the belly. They were gung-ho, ready to go. And Jesus saw their potential, but he also understood much more clearly than they that the fire could burn in two different directions. And standing there looking down on that Samaritan village, Jesus pointed out the two directions. He didn't come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. Now back to John's story. You know, zeal for the truth, passions for a just cause, can drive us to destroy those we perceive as our enemies, or it can drive us to redeem them. John hadn't been able to see that distinction. He didn't know what kind of spirit was driving him. He thought it was a spirit of loyalty and fervour. He didn't see the raw anger inside, the destructive anger. John was a very earnest, sincere young man. John was also a very angry young man. Bad things happen to all of us in this life. Bad things can happen to us in childhood. Bad things can happen to us as we go through school. Friends can betray us and spouses can abuse us. And sometimes those bad things seep way down deep inside, don't they? We can't forget. We can't forgive. The wound doesn't heal and anger starts building up. We want so badly to change that bad thing that happened to us. We want to fix it. We want to get even. But we can't change the past, so our anger keeps seeping out in all kinds of ways. What can we do about this kind of anger? What can replace it? How do we keep indignation from becoming a cloak for rage? Well, let's take a look at how Christ dealt with this angry young man, John. 
because something remarkable happened to John, the son of thunder. We move many months past that run-in between John and the inhospitable Samaritan village. The scene, an upper room somewhere in Jerusalem. It had been reserved for the Passover meal Christ wanted to celebrate with his 12 apostles. As they gathered in the lengthening shadows of evening, these men could sense that something significant was going to happen. Walking up the stairs to the upper room, they started talking about the kingdom Christ promised to establish. And then their eyes fell on the low table where the Passover meal had been laid out. They looked down at the pillows arranged around three sides of the table where they could recline. This was a formal Passover supper. Who would be sitting where? Who would have the honoured positions next to Christ? Well, as human nature would have it, all 12 felt highly qualified. All had observed Christ's teachings. All had performed miracles in His name. All had proclaimed the good news in His name. John wasn't the only highly driven individual in this crowd. And standing there awkwardly, these men found themselves bickering about who would sit where. They just couldn't help it. The 12 had spent a long time together, plenty of time to acquire grudges and resentments, and each of them wanted the top position. In the end, Judas managed to manoeuvre his way to the side of Christ. After all, as he always reminded the rest, he was the treasurer, and John reclined on the other side. The others slowly stretched out around the table and looked daggers at Judas and John. It was time to celebrate the Passover, the memorial of God's great deliverance of Israel from Egypt. But the air in the upper room seemed heavy that evening. It seemed that all the resentful words the disciples had muttered were still suspended there. Suddenly, Christ rose to his feet. He stepped over to a water basin. At first, the disciples assumed it was time for the ritual hand washing that was part of the Passover meal. But then Jesus laid aside his outer garment. He took a towel and tucked it into his waistband. He poured water from a pitcher into the basin and then moved back toward his disciples. Kneeling down, he removed one of the man's sandals and without a word, he began to bathe to wash the man's feet. He washed the dirt and grime of the streets of Jerusalem from his toes. And then Jesus moved to the next man and the next. John watched this in awe. There was Jesus, the picture of a slave performing this menial task. But it wasn't something menial, this washing of feet. It wasn't just a dirty chore. To John, it seemed something quite glorious. He stared at Jesus' hands as the master worked washing, drying from one disciple to the next. Those were remarkable hands. He'd seen them at work before. He'd seen them take a little girl's pale, lifeless hand as the family wept and wailed around her. He'd watched as Christ's hands had lifted the little child from a deathbed. John had seen those hands touch a paralyzed man, staring helplessly at the pool of Bethesda. He'd seen the man rise and walk. John had seen those hands lifted in prayer before a hungry crowd of 5,000. He'd seen those hands break a few loaves of bread into that meal that satisfied them all. He'd seen those hands lifted to defend a woman caught in the act of adultery from those ready to stone her. John had seen those hands touch the eyes of a man born blind and create sight where none existed before. John had seen those hands do a lot during his time with Jesus and it all flooded over him as he stared at Jesus washing the soiled feet of his disciples. Those were powerful hands. They were omnipotent hands. But above all, they were hands of love. They blessed whatever they touched. They had come to save, not to destroy. At length, Jesus came to John and undid his sandals. He began to wash his feet. And at that moment, it didn't seem to matter who was sitting where at the table. 
It didn't matter who would be the most honored in the kingdom. This incredible love was all that mattered. And as Jesus washed John's feet, the son of thunder felt his anger being washed away at last. Christ's love had finally overcome it. Christ's love was stronger than all the hurt, all the rage, all the misguided zeal. Years later, John would remember this crucial moment in his life. He would remember how much it meant to him. This is the way that he himself would describe it in John chapter 13, verses 3 to 5. Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he had come from God and was going to God, rose from supper and laid aside his garments, took a towel and girded himself. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet. Jesus deserved to be exalted to the highest place in heaven, but he had occupied the lowest place on earth. John was overwhelmed by the Master's glorious act. At last he'd found something to replace his religion of anger. It was love, pure and simple. All of Jesus' life came together in that one beautiful act in the upper room. As a Christian, when I participate in the foot washing service in my church, I feel that love flowing through my heart again. Friends, Jesus has a solution for people consumed by anger. He has a solution for those whose religion is driven by anger, for those whose restless drive in life is motivated by anger. You can never do enough to quench that anger. You can never accomplish enough to get even with the bad things that happened. There's always more anger left over at the end. It's only love that can quench our anger. It's only love that can heal the wounds. We can never, never, never change the past, but we can be loved in the present. And here's how it happens. John was transformed in the end because he had experienced three and a half years of fellowship with Jesus. Jesus is capable of pouring love into our hearts. Here's how. Jesus wants us to open ourselves up to him so he can wash our feet so he can show us what gracious love is all about and wash our hearts. Jesus can wash away our anger. He did it for John. He transformed the fiery son of thunder. Toward the end of John's life, we find him in chains on the Isle of Patmos, imprisoned for his faith. He knows that he'll probably die alone, separated from the fellow believers who mean everything to him. But John doesn't rage on that island. He doesn't call fire down from heaven on the Roman soldiers who guard him. He doesn't anguish because he won't occupy an honored position in the kingdom at the end of his life. No, instead, John writes. He sends out epistles and they are some of the most beautiful love letters this world has ever seen. Oh, John was still thundering at the end. He still had fire in his belly. He still had plenty of passion and zeal, but now it was love that he thundered out. It was love that compelled him. John had become the apostle of love. Have you experienced that kind of unconditional, gracious love that transformed the son of thunder? Are you still driven by anger? We can try to replace our pain and rage in countless ways. But there's only one real solution. Only love can wash away our anger. Let's open up our hearts to Christ's transforming power. Let's allow the powerful, loving hands of Christ wash away our anger to do their powerful work in us right now as we pray. Dear Father, we come to you because anger is burning us out because everything we try to do doesn't really fill the emptiness inside us. We need the hands that heal the paralytic and the blind man. We need the hands that raise the dead. 
We confess our need for your forgiveness and cleansing right now. We ask that Jesus the Saviour place His gracious hands on us right now. Please pour out your love inside our hearts. In the name of the Master, who washes His disciples' feet. Amen. The story of John the Apostle, who underwent a remarkable transformation as a disciple from the quick-tempered son of thunder to the compassionate apostle of love, has encouraged and inspired people all over the world. If you're struggling with the challenges and stress of everyday life and would like to experience God's unconditional love, if you're looking for ways to live a better life and to find inner peace and true happiness, if you'd like to get closer to God, then I'd like to recommend the free gift we have for all our viewers today. It's the book, The Greatest Act of Kindness. This booklet is our gift to you and is absolutely free. There are no costs or obligations whatsoever. So make the most of this wonderful opportunity to receive the gift we have for you today. Here's the information you need. Phone or text us at 0436 333 55 in Australia or 020 422 2042 in New Zealand or visit our website www.tij.tv to request today's free offer and we'll send it to you totally free of charge and with no obligation. So don't delay. Call or text 0436 333 55 in Australia or 020 422 2042 in New Zealand or visit our website to request today's offer. Write to us at GPO Box 274 Sydney, New South Wales, 2001, Australia, or P.O. Box 76673, Manukau, Auckland, 2241, New Zealand. Don't delay. Call or text us now. If you've enjoyed today's journey to ancient Bethsaida in Israel and our reflections on the life and times of John the Apostle, then be sure to join us again next week when we will share another of life's journeys together. Until then, remember the ultimate destination of life's journey. Now I saw a new heaven and a new earth, and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There shall be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. There shall be no more pain, for the former things have passed away.